Hello, and welcome to this very interesting and special episode. Uh, this is something new, even though we're still in Ryan's office and uh, still aboard Battleship New Jersey. Um, we have ourselves uh, a Drake Hello. Hello. Um, and of course, Ryan Szymanski, um, Jack with Bering Strait and the U.S. Naval Institute. And I have Rick Russell um, of Bering Strait and uh, GDIT, formerly of the Naval Institute as well. Um, whether or not, Rick, why don't you, um, gentlemen, I assume the internet knows who you are. I hope so. I hope so. The question is, do we know who we are? Yes. Right. Um, just <laughs> in case, no just in case the podcast we did with Rick hasn't come out yet. Rick, why don't you just briefly reintroduce yourself to the uh, ladies and gentlemen here? Very briefly. Okay. I started as a historian at the old Naval Historical Center, which is the uh, Naval History and Heritage Command. Um, I'm a uh, U.S. Navy subject matter expert for GDIT right now. And in between, I spent 20 years in publishing, including 13 years as the director of Naval Institute Press. Great. And you're also dead. And dead. There mm -hmm. we go. Okay. Just in case we were unsure of the relationship <laughs> here. The weird uncle, but no. The weird uncle. <laughs> the weird dad. Okay. Russell's just a pretty common last name. Yeah. Yeah. So we're here to discuss this book and the topic within you want to brief the uh the audience on this sure this book came up in the office um the talk of this book came up in the office i'll do it okay. as uh this month uh october 2024 and it's called too far on a whim the limits of high steam propulsion in the u.s navy and it's by tyler petroff who's a historian at the naval history and heritage command and it was published by the University of Alabama Press, a competitor with the Naval Institute for many years. And essentially, Petros um, says that the U.S. Navy succeeded uh, in World War II, particularly against Imperial Japan, despite its high steam propulsion systems rather than because of them. So this is very interesting because it, in the office, we talk about successful innovation in the Navy. And there's three programs that we kind of focus on. There are many others, of course, but um, uh, during the American Civil War, they created a special bureau for ironclads and built a monitor. Uh, but then more recently, uh, after World War II, uh, Polaris, the Polaris missile system, Polaris submarines, and, um, and the Aegis air defense system. So with that in mind, he says we need to keep how the Navy innovates since we're spending so much money on it, uh, those practices in mind. And they were very methodical, but in some cases handled over a short period of time. Uh, Polaris, for example, um, you know, they deployed ballistic missile submarines in just, you know, half a decade. Um, but in this case, he says that they didn't do any of that, and they adopted um, high steam pretty much on the word of a couple admirals in the Bureau of Engineering. Mm -hmm. And because there were so few experts in the Navy, and they were all junior to these admirals, that um, even the general board, that was their quote, too far on a whim. They essentially said, we've, went, we've gone down this road so far, we're just going to have to go with it. Um, and as a result, it looks like high pressure steam was oversold. And it really didn't deliver the fuel efficiency and the operational range uh, that these admirals had promised. And when we're talking about high pressure steam in this case, are we talking about the 600 pound plants that a lot of, that obviously this ship has? Yes. Right. Yes. As compared to the three to 350 that you see on Royal Navy and Italian yeah. ships and yeah. so forth. So we're, we're and not even to, older yeah, yeah, US yeah, Navy older ships. ships. The old, the interwar standard. Exactly. So this is that next generation of steam plan um, that sort of became the foundation for a lot of the a lot of the ship classes that we see during World War II. So it's not just battleship New Jersey. It's not just the big fleet carriers. It's pretty much everything. And it started with the destroyers in the 30s. Yeah, they needed the operational range in the Pacific. That was the idea. Okay, so, so pretty much yeah. treaty era and then the two ocean Navy ships that come after that. The, the 
modern ships would fight World War II with. Right. So <laughs> doing right here. The yeah. idea that this book now is saying the power plants or the steam plants in those ships, there was actually some sort of problem with them. The there are many problems. And after the two ocean Navy Act, when you're already building South Dakota class battleships, mm-hmm. North Carolina's come out, Washington is almost they're, they're almost completed, is that yeah. Um, later they re- they they reveal that they don't have the fuel economy because they were based on commercial ideas um, and warships behave much differently. Uh, but before that, there weren't that many people. So they ran into trading problems. Uh, there weren't enough people to knew how to operate them. Um, and just, you know, it's kind of nerdy history stuff, but it comes out of our office too. We talk about supply chain now. Like it doesn't take a month to build one SM3 missile. You know, you can build it if you had all the parts. What's taking so long is getting all the component parts to our shipyards to build ships, to build missiles and this kind of thing. Well, what comes out here is they were already going through supply chain problems because the reduction gears and I know you know it, but yeah. yeah. Mm. And there's one that's they're slightly different, right? It's like calibrated. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. One of our uh, four is out of spec and caused issues for the ship throughout her whole career. Yeah, there you go. So that's the kind of things they were dealing with. And for me, as a historian and, and looking at this, I think we have to, we're going to have to look at operations a little differently. And we're going to have to look at the end of behavior of these individual, individual ships differently. And maybe even ideas about, you know, they were, everyone was busy back then, but, you know, they suspended Montana in what, April of 42. They canceled the class in July of 43. And we know you could list all the reasons, you know, we need to build other ships, smaller ships, and that kind of thing. Um, but the back of their mind, it could be that, you know what, we're also having problems with steam products. The last thing we need is another, uh, you know, five more of these things that are going <laughs> to, you know, with, Bigger, bigger and more bigger. boilers than yeah, yeah, yeah. the ship, yeah, or the carriers, yeah, and then and the engineering five more engineering departments that are ginormous, you know, that kind of thing. He also makes the point that because of the fuel uh, efficiency and this range problem, is that it really resulted, it kind of rippled through, it did ripple through shipbuilding. They had to build more fast, faster, more and faster tankers, uh, the ones they thought they were going to live with. Uh, Right, right, cutting it, uh, and, and maybe uh, that got maybe that got a bit hidden in the fact that they were building so many additional ships. They needed more tankers anyway. Well, but then also, half of the high speed tankers of the mm, uh, was it Cimarron class could turn into Sagamon class carriers or escort mm, carriers. Like, yeah, he he brings that up. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, and that's it. That's why it's it's an interesting historical problem because mm. they were making all kinds of decisions. Got to convert a couple to a carriers, you know, to carriers, or how many ever it was, and we're building so many ships mm. uh, that. It, but what about the, what about the differences in the supply chain when you manufacture smaller versus larger ships? So if it takes three years to build a battleship, even under wartime conditions, mm. three years is still a long time. So if it takes. GE or whatever company to manufacture those turbines or and what the same thing goes for the reduction gears or whatever, you can hide that delay in a capital ship like New Jersey or a, or a larger. Mm-hmm. But what about the destroyers? What about smaller ships that have these plants mm-hmm. that like, could you build, could we have had more Fletchers and more gearings or, or you know, or those ships? Um, if these systems were easier to manufacture. Yeah, well, I mean, the bottleneck, the bottleneck, it was always historically the reduction gears. You could make the turbines, but mm-hmm. the redu- and this is a major problem with you know engineering, unsurprisingly, mm-hmm. um, is you can have stuff that's, if you like, bulk item, you can massively increase the production of bulk mm-hmm. item stuff, so hulls, to mm-hmm. a certain extent, guns, although maybe not quite as much, mm-hmm. and even um, boilers, because it's it's a known thing. Mm-hmm. Each individual component is not 
Yeah, I mean, they're precise, but they're not massively precise. It, manufacturing is so, relatively yeah, standard. You, yeah. you can set up a expanded manufacturing very quickly. The problem with, with reduction gearing is not only is it in and of itself an extremely precise art, mm -hmm. but because it's so precise, it's also not something that can be accelerated. Because, mm -hmm. you know, if you're manufacturing boilers, let's say, or, or hulls, you can put an extra shift on. They do exactly the same work as the previous guys. Mm -hmm. You've now increased your speed of production. When you are very carefully, you know, producing your reduction gears, you mm -hmm. cannot increase the speed of that work because if you do, you'll mm -hmm. break the bits and ruin the gears. And it's also not the kind of thing where you can, you know, drag someone in off the street and go, hey, look, here's, here's a rivet gun, here's an arc welder, we're going to teach you how to use it in a few weeks now, get on with the job. Um, <laughs> someone who's going to be precise enough, especially in the 40s where it's all hand done, you haven't got computer aided controls, someone who's skilled enough to cut reduction gears is an extremely skilled, experienced worker, that's not something you can quickly draft in. Um, and so you can increase production a little bit, but it is a bottleneck. And the more complex you're making it, mm -hmm. the more you're putting a throttle on it. Because, uh, you know, as I've mentioned, you've got things like double reduction gears for the high pressure steam plants. Well, that's mm -hmm. an additional level of complexity upon, uh, up on top of single reduction gears. Mm -hmm. So, you know, while, yeah, there, there's, probably still a bottleneck at the reduction gearing stage. If you were doing the simpler reduction gears, you'd have the lower pressures plants, you might have been able to produce more of them, which would have meant more steam, not necessarily more ships, because there was a steel shortage as well, mm -hmm. eventually, but you could have perhaps had more ships with turbine propulsion, as opposed to the diesel propulsion, diesel electric propulsion, mm -hmm. turbo electric, all the various things they were experimenting with, especially with the destroyer escorts. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, uh, reduction gears are isn't is, aren't they like helical? Isn't that the term? Mm. Or yeah, where the when you look at it, the the gear is at cut at an angle. Yes, and um, versus a straight cut gear mm -hmm. is what kind of like people generally yeah. think of. Um, I think ours are double helical mm -hmm. in that they're cut at two angles. Right, yeah. they, they come in. Yeah. So there's a whole load of reasons for that, but part of it is just increasing the surface area of contact per right. tooth. And if it's you the, had it straight, they just snap. It's stress. the same concept of sloped versus straight armor mm -hmm. on a tank. You're, yeah. you're by sloping it, you're you're increasing that surface area. Yeah. Um, Tanks and I so, so, so no 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 no. I'm, so I'm, I'm going to bring I'm going to bring this up, and this is the super nerdy stuff, and I don't know, if, but. Um, we like helical cut gears in the United States. Mm. And that was one of the things that our industry understood was really important. And obviously, as we're saying, mm. when you're cutting a helical gear the size of a room for <laughs> a reduction mm. gear on a battleship, that takes a long time. And that tooling and that, and that um, knowledge to cut those gears is really precise. Um, and that was the problem the Germans were having during mm -hmm. World War II in just not in anything, being able to cut helical type gears. And that was why the Panther kept breaking transmissions because Panther final drives had straight cut gears and they would just, they would snap and break mm -hmm. because, um, and I remember this, this report of, uh, captured Shermans going back to Germany and they take them apart and they realize the Sherman, which is like a generic, <laughs> which is we're going to make 50,000 of them tank. Everything had helical cut gears <laughs> um, from the gearbox to the final drives to the actual gears that were driving like the magnetos in the engine. And I remember the, the, hearing that this German officer was like, holy crap, we have so lost this war <laughs> because they're, they're putting these really fine, precise gears in literally everything. And here we can only afford to do it in the gearboxes that go into Tiger tanks. Meanwhile, the Panthers are blowing transmissions like there's no tomorrow. Um, but so to this point, you know, even though we can do that to build tanks and stuff, it's still a slow process. Mm. It doesn't change that fact. And when you build reduction boxes for these turbines, well, it's just naturally going to take time. And so to your to your point, you could have gone with simpler gear sets, perhaps, but could you handle the load? Can you of the of these high pressure of these high pressure steam plants? And suddenly, well, you could have gotten it out the door, 
but suddenly now all your ships need new gearboxes. <laughs> and you can replace the transmission in a Panther. You, you can't, can't replace no. the reduction gears in a battleship if if one of those snaps. Right. Well, there's a reason in the Cold War that it was like you know one of the absolute worst things you could do to sabotage the gearing because virtually any other part of the machinery plant could be repaired or to a certain extent replaced. Mm-hmm. I mean. Yeah, okay, you're not going to replace the entire turbine set, but you'd have to really know what you were doing to mess up an entire turbine set. A few blades, not mm-hmm. a problem. But yeah, if you like chuck a spanner in the gears, that ship's that done for for years. Mm-hmm. And, and what did you say the misalignment in New Jersey's shaft four gearbox? It's uh, something like one one hundredth of an inch off. Yeah. They're supposed we're, to have a thousandth of an inch tolerance. Yeah. So just that little bit yeah. of, of extra lash there on those gear sets means you're, didn't you say like you, you, you lose a certain amount and what, what, what is it, that it costing? It overheated a lot. It burned yeah. out a lot of bearings. It was yeah. uh, causing all sorts of other issues. They, they started to remove bearings from the propellers, uh, propeller shaft to try and keep it cooler. And they, they never did fully solve that problem. And yet this is the Iowa class battleship made up to the highest speed so, with yeah. one quarter of its plant having issues. So like how many other issues are on the other ships? Or I guess the, the fun right. question is, had she, had she not had the issue with that box? What ooh, speed could she have attained? 35 point whatever, yeah. you know, could be. 35.2. Could be 0.3 or 4 or something, yeah. you know. So. I mean, this, <laughs> this is one of the things you've got to remember when it comes to these kind of complex um, complex mm-hmm. machines is that mm-hmm. when you're trying to manufacture something like a reduction gear, the larger it is, the exponentially harder it becomes to produce mm-hmm. because the reduction gear in a Sherman might have uh, arbitrarily, let's say, 20 teeth mm-hmm. sets. How many teeth sets are there in the reduction gear on an Iowa? And the yeah, bigger. Like count. <laughs> um, and, and it's the larger bit that also makes it a lot harder because when you're mm-hmm. talking especially about this manual tool, manually guided tools, mm-hmm. it's kind of like, well, if if someone gives you a pen and mm-hmm. says, right, here's a here's a, a notepad, like a book, a notebook the size of this book, and says, mm-hmm. right, draw a straight line freehand across that page. Mm-hmm. Take a few of those, you might be able to do it. Mm-hmm. If someone says, here's a bit of paper the size of this table, now draw a dead straight line along the length of it mm-hmm. freehand. Virtually no one's going to be able to do that. Someone mm-hmm. with half a half decent, you know, hand eye coordination could do it with a book. And it's the same kind of thing with, with gearing. It's like it's still very high precision to do it for a Sherman tank drive, but it's a lot, lot easier than it is to do for for a ship's reduction. In much the same way as like, you know, boring the rifling out on a Garand versus mm-hmm. boring the right thing out <laughs> on a 16-inch 50. Mm-hmm. Like, one of those can be done fairly quickly by someone you could train <laughs> up in a month. The other one is, uh, is is a work of months by an extremely skilled set of people, mm-hmm. and you absolutely cannot screw it up. because <laughs> Back to the drawing board, and <laughs> we wasted three months of work. And that is the only reason why every American infantryman didn't have a 16-inch 50 caliber rifle. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I mean, we've clearly established, you know, in the in the uh, in the documentary movie Battleship, that American World War II veterans are clearly capable of sporting like half a ton each on their shoulders. So I got two shells here and here. Where where are we going? You know. Um, So we talked about the manufacturing. uh, Obviously, the manufacturing issues Mm. with. uh, Ever more precise gearing to reduce the um, because we're talking high pressure steam. I guess we should explain this. So high pressure steam, that more and more steam pressure means you can force, uh, I guess you can make turbines more and more efficient Mm -hmm. in terms of like blade design, blade count, and then, you know, you force more steam at a higher pressure, then produce more power, more revs. Obviously you have to then gear that power down to an acceptable amount of rotations Mm -hmm. on the shaft. So you have to have stronger and stronger gearboxes with, more and more gear sets down, like double single mm. reduction, double reduction. Yeah. That's what yeah. that means. Because your, your yeah. turbine's going to mm. spin at a speed that's far too fast for efficient propulsion. Yeah. But under, say, 300, 350 psi, there's only so much energy per second you can put into a set of turbine mm-hmm. blades. So it's still going to be far too fast, but you can reduce it down, mm-hmm. which is obviously what they did in the run-up to the First World War. Mm-hmm. But then if you're talking about 600 or 650 PSI, you're putting a lot more energy into your turbine. Therefore, your turbine can spin faster, but that's not any good for you in and of itself. But, you know, if you tried to do a reduction gear that 
took it that took down a high speed plant mm. to the rotations per minute you needed on the shaft in a single step it would be an absolutely monstrous thing that looked like a Ferris wheel, which would take, you know, probably the whole war to produce properly. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you do it in two stages with a double reduction, you know, it it makes the actual reduction give itself a more complex item, but one that is possible to make out of individually slightly less complex parts. Right. And this is a and if anyone needs a different way of looking at it. This is the same way that a turboprop aircraft engine works. You have a small jet engine spinning at a lot of revs that is then geared down to turn a traditional propeller at a speed that is normal for an aircraft. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So, we, so we've talked about that. Um, what about some of the actual, getting back to the steam plant aspect of things, um, Rick, how did this affect Navy ships in terms of uh, reliability and range and other things like that. Well, I think we have to start looking at the ships that had issues and had problems. Um, not debilitating, but North Carolina did, and she's mentioned in the book, first battleship um, uh, since West Virginia, eighteen years. Um, but I think well, he's saying that they didn't have the range. Okay, so that's going to affect this put a lot of staff work being done, recalculating range charts and things like that. And they said it didn't have accurate or um, they couldn't mass produce range charts like they had had, always had. They, they weren't really ready by the end of the war because they had no experience with these mm -hmm. things. Okay, so, um, but I think for me, it's just me talking. I think there's some larger issues here. You know, there was this push pull between the Navy Department and the Roosevelt administration over the Fletcher class versus we got to build some DEs. Mm. And I think there's a lot of pertinent reasons, uh, substantial reasons the Navy case, uh, the Navy made for wanting to focus on Fletcher's, you know, much mm. larger, you know, general purpose ship that can function in the Pacific. Um, and the Roosevelt administration says, well, we've got the British experience, mm. you know, both currently and in World War I. Um, but I'm wondering now if, because the Navy, the Navy didn't disagree with the Roosevelt administration. They just tried to keep them at arm's length while they got these Fletchers going. Now I'm wondering if it's partly because of the supply, these issues connected to being able to propel these ships. Well, and when you look at the development of the Ds, you know, especially early on, almost every class is coming out with a slightly different propulsion set mm -hmm. when they're mm -hmm. trying to work out what do we do instead of, you know, some of them have eight diesels, some of them have four diesels and electric generators and so on and so forth. So it's it's clearly something that even even with the delay they managed to get in, in constructing them in the first place, they're still trying to work out what to do instead. Mm -hmm. It's and just they're forced to the work fly. that out while right. the ships are under construction. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. even like the DE, like, like Slater, mm -hmm. that's most of them are all diesel, right? Uh, no, those some of them are diesel are electric. Diesel electric. Yeah. Um, so they're just so that's like um, I guess. But my question was, they were all basically diesel versus something. steam. Yes. Or uh, were there some steam turbine? Some were steam turbine. Uh, uh, some were uh, turbo electric. Mm. Okay. Steam. Um, but for the diesel electric, so we're talking about the mm. supply chain issue. Go, go figure. Um, <laughs> But like a diesel electric DE, that's off the shelf diesel electric locomotive parts, yeah. essentially, right? Although it wasn't initially their first choice. So I think that one of their first choices, which you see on some of the early DEs, was eight submarine diesels. Mm -hmm. And then they realized uh, that's four submarines worth of diesels. We, yeah, we'd we, rather we, have we, the submarines. Yeah, we, we need some of those. So yeah. they ended up going to four diesels with diesel electric. Mm -hmm. Because the either diesel electric or turbo electric are essentially the same principle, just yeah. whether you know it got diesel or turbine behind it. Um, but that's a neat way of sidestepping the need for gearing, because with you know, with the gearing, you're taking the actual rotational energy of your power plant mm -hmm. and just stepping it down in in velocity. Mm -hmm. um, with the diesel electric or turbo electric system. Instead of stepping it down physically with gearing, 
you're turning it from rotational energy into electrical energy, which is then turned back into a rotational energy with the electric motor. But you can regulate that by just right. a, a variable resistor or something mm -hmm. similar to that, uh, which in some ways is good because it means you can completely bypass the need to produce gears because the production of electric generators is, and motors is a completely different part of the industry. Mm -hmm. But there is a slight inefficiency in that, in that it's a heavier system. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was the whole debate that, you know, because initially the North Carolinas were supposed to be turbo electric ships. Mm -hmm. And then they decided there was no way they could fit the other specs they needed with, in a, with a turbo electric drive. They had to use the lighter re reduction gear system. Yeah. When a gigantic reduction gear box is the lighter yeah. option, <laughs> yeah. you, you know. Um, and there's also um, en energy efficiency issues because if you have rotational energy that's going through a gearing system into more rotational energy, really all you're losing is a little bit of friction and mm -hmm. noise um, in terms of energy transformation. Whereas if you're doing a, uh, a, a turbo electric system, there is an energy loss turning essentially kinetic rotational energy into electricity. Mm -hmm. And then there's another loss turning that electricity back into rotational energy. Mm -hmm. So the total amount you get out of the other end is, is a little less. bit less. Right. So it's not ideal, mm -hmm. but it is a solution for you know a DE that doesn't need to do 28 knots. Mm -hmm. Well, but then I, I always like to think about the idea of um, Queen Mary mm -hmm. versus Normandy. Queen Mary having that traditional power plant, mm. gear turbines and everything, and then Normandy having the you know state of the art, state of the art mm. um, turbo electric yeah. um, power plant, and you know being able to go those thirty plus knots at that mm. at that length and tonnage. Um, it's just interesting the the two routes that those countries took to achieve sort yeah. of the same thing. Um, so again, like to make your point. Mm. It's possible to to go fast on turbo electric. Possible to go fast or go slow on either. Or it's just maybe what fits the, the yeah. actual situation the the best. Um, so yeah, sticking with the U.S. Navy, your Lexington class battle cruisers turned aircraft carriers mm -hmm. are turbo electric, mm -hmm. and your Iowa class battleships, similar size, similar mm -hmm. speed, are steam turbine. And so, and and when you have to build a capital ship of the size of a Lexington class battle cruiser and you give it turbo electric generators, those turbo electric plants are coming directly from turbo electric plants <laughs> on land mm -hmm. because yeah. you know this is this is the same size system. And then that's how you end up being able to plug your aircraft carrier yeah. <laughs> into a city. <laughs> well, a, a, a turbo electric drive system is essentially just a land-based power plant yeah. system. Mm -hmm. It's just instead of once you generate electricity, instead of sending out by wires to people's homes, you're sending it to a pair of well two or four gigantic motors mm. which then turn a propeller right so it's exactly the same system otherwise right um so and you still have to and it's not and just like diesels that are turning electric uh generators um that's still pretty you still have to run the engine pretty hard to generate mm. that electricity there's no like oh i can just run the engine at idle and somehow mm. produce enough power to then be able to go full speed on the propeller yeah you still have to run the engine in a in a pretty decent relationship between you know what you're trying to the, the speed that you're trying to accomplish. So um, you mentioned the, the 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 slight reduction mm. in power as you convert to yeah. different energy types. Um, Alex, do you know? Um, uh, do you have any thoughts about maybe fuel economy of? Turbo electric versus traditional, like shafted. It's it's a trade off because on the one hand you are losing more energy mm -hmm. in the transmission of that energy because mm -hmm. you you consider you're starting off with chemical energy in your fuel, which you're turning into heat, which you're turning into kinetic, and then all the other stuff that we talked about. Yeah. Um, the the trade off is that although the turbo electric system is slightly less efficient at transmitting the energy for turning the energy from your fuel oil into your speed of your share the flip side of it is that because you can to a certain degree control your speed mm -hmm. by varying the amount of electricity you're feeding your motors you can keep the turbine at the bit which is the base of it all running at a constant speed which is more efficient because every turbine has a mm -hmm. ideal running speed mm -hmm. with a Direct, direct, well, not direct drive, but a reduction gear system. If you want to speed up 
the turbine has to go faster. If you want mm. to slow down, the turbine has to go slower. Mm. And so there will be a speed at which it's the most fuel efficient. And mm. any speed that you do that's outside of that, it'll mm. become less fuel efficient. Whereas with the turboelectric system, you know, if you're, let's say, for sake of argument, you've decided your, your ideal cruising speed and therefore the speed you want your machinery plant to be optimal at is 16 knots. Mm -hmm. So at 16 knots, a reduction geared powered ship will be far more fuel economical than a turbo electric drive ship doing 16 knots. But the minute you break out of that, then the turbo electric system, because the turbine is still just chugging away at the same speed, mm -hmm. will become more efficient. Mm -hmm. Um, than your reduction gear ship, which is why the turbo electric system shows up first in commercial shipping because you know mm -hmm. it, you you start heading for New York from Paris or yeah. Plymouth, and it's like, well, set speed to this, don't move the throttle till we get to New York. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect for a turbo electric system, um, and you know, perfect for pretty much any any system that just has a nice constant running speed, whereas for a warship with speeding up and slowing down and so forth, mm. it's, 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 it becomes a bit more complex. And, and I think that actually yeah. plays into the, what they're saying about the um, high speed in, in this book, because there's a whole section where they're talking about the fact that the high speed plants and all the mm. systems leading from it were optimized for low to medium speed mm -hmm. because there was this assumption that in the Pacific, you would be fighting out like you fought, fought it out in some of the early fleet problems where the majority of the fleet's consumption of fuel will be sailing from the west coast across to Pearl Harbor, across to the Philippines, to the Japanese home islands. Then you'd have a you know a few hours of high speed steaming fighting it out, mm -hmm. and then it would be back to cruising to get back home again. And that, but in the actual Pacific War between submarine scares and the need to you know relocate assets and constant air attacks and everything else, the ships the US Navy is actually using end up maneuvering at high speed a lot more mm -hmm. than they ever anticipated. And then if you've got this high speed plant, which obviously needs a lot of energy being put into it, therefore it needs more fuel to go into mm -hmm. it. If suddenly your ships are operating in uh, a speed regimen where you're outside of that ideal low to medium speed that you optimized it for, you're actually going to end up burning phenomenal amounts of fuel compared to your anticipated figures um hence why you you need a huge convoy of oilers and everything to keep you going because you're now you're now burning fuel at a less efficient speed point so i think that's what ties this all together is yeah, that the exactly. navy rushed these high high pressure plants mm -hmm. these high speed plants into all these ships and then the use case sort of changed mm -hmm. in their mind they were, they were taking this from a commercial experience which well, as Brad just said, doesn't apply. Yeah. yeah, and so then you end up with ships in theater, which are now using exponentially more fuel mm -hmm. than anticipated, and you end up with you know having to actually hold operations back as they wait for more oil and other things, and then mm -hmm. ships having to trade off positions because one has more than the other, and all these other things. Um, yeah. So and again, there's there's elements of that that's going to be hidden by the other aspects of your ship design mm. and logistics. Because if you have the fleet oilers, it disguises the problem. You may be using more fuel than is ideal. You actually have a lot of fuel available in the US, a lot of oil. It's it's not unlimited, but essentially, as far as World War II is concerned, it might as well be unlimited. Sure. So, you know, whereas the, compared to the Japanese, who are like, where do we find oil? Right. <laughs> um, right. So if you've got loads of oil and loads of oilers, the fact that you're burning more fuel than you thought on a grand strategy scale isn't as much of a problem as it might otherwise have been, mm -hmm. but transplant that same set of issues to virtually any other Navy and it would become a very rapidly become far, far more obvious than perhaps it has been. Well, if Germany had gone to war in 1939 and suddenly the next day they realized all their ships were burning three times the, the fuel that <laughs> they had anticipated, suddenly that's a huge problem. No, I'm, I'm glad you brought up Germany because oh. it does give me some consolation that the US Navy isn't the only Navy that makes this... Uh, mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah. well, but like the diesel plants and like the German battleships, yeah. right? They were a lot of the the subsequent classes were losing. They were going to these diesel plants, uh, right? And yeah. Right? Well, I mean the 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 di diesel plants, and I think this is this is an interesting contrast in that the diesel plants 
offered a lot more efficiency, mm-hmm. but their power density was a lot lower. Mm-hmm. So if you wanted you know, to go to a certain speed, you need a certain amount of power, that means you need a certain amount of machinery. But if you like your, your power per square foot or power per ton mm-hmm. for diesels at that point was still quite low. So you'd had, if you wanted to go 32 knots on diesels, you basically need your entire lower deck to just be diesel (laughs) generators or engines. Um, And that's why you have like the Deutschlands. Yeah, the Deutschlands can go for miles and miles and miles and miles at 28 knots. Yeah. So if you want to go faster than that, sorry, you you, you can't. If you took exactly the same hole and stuck a steam turbine plant in it, it would go much faster. Mm -hmm. Um, But... For uh, the other problem was the the you know while we're talking about 600, 650 psi for the for the American systems, the Germans were pushing it further and further still, mm-hmm. and discovering pretty much all these reliability issues. You know, to the point you have that famous incident with Prince Eugen, and mm-hmm. you send the German crew home, and t- two days later, seven out of eight eight of your yeah. boilers are just gone. No, yeah. we're we're pack, packing it in, yeah. and it wasn't, and that was, I mean, that was an extreme thing, but the the a lot of the German high pressure plants. They, they kind of. I, I think I said in one video. They, they they only work if you have an expert octopus engineering crew because they're constantly fixing every which way. Mm-hmm. And the German approach to that was, oh, we have this problem, therefore we will design this other machine or this other <laughs> process which will mitigate this problem, which then reveals another problem. So you end up with this incredibly complex, or almost steampunk labyrinth style mm-hmm. engine room where half of the stuff is actually machines to fix the problems of the other machines and you need an engineering crew who understand all of this and if any one person does their job ever so slightly wrong the whole thing grinds to a screaming halt well then didn't they bring back prince Eugen's crew so that they could sail it out to the pacific yeah well because initially they were looking yeah. at it and they were just like well it's a, it's a high pressure steam plant we understand this it's like yeah. no 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 no, 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 no. <laughs> um, and they've got like the f boats the one of the most hilariously ill-designed ships ever but mm. they were so terrible they spent so much time alongside that very quickly, even though Germany's not exactly you know overflowing with warships, mm. they was they were so so terrible machinery wise. They ended up just being relegated to training ships and you know secondary line roles. And every so often, someone would be like, "We're really really short of warships. We should put these back in the front line." And, and three months later, they're like, "Oh yeah, that's why we didn't do that." <laughs> <laughs> um, so, um, what about? Can you you want to talk about? Um, the the link to maybe North Carolina or Gibbs and Cox or um, some of these other points that you, you brought up. Well, we've had Gibbs and Cox on the mind lately mm-hmm. because of the United States, mm-hmm. and um, uh, he was strictly focused on commercial shipbuilding. And then you the, can't talk about high speed commercial mm-hmm. shipbuilding without talking about Gibbs and Cox. Exactly, and and he was producing ever faster ships. And in, in his mind, his job was to build, his focus was to build the largest and fastest passenger ship, which the, getting drafted into the Navy, mm-hmm. uh, Navy world in the 30s, and then of course during the 40s, uh, delayed somewhat. But um, yeah, it was Admiral Bowen, who was, uh, um, I guess he was uh, Deputy Chief of uh, Bureau of Engineering, and then eventually uh, the Chief of Engineering, who um, Wrote the and left the first contracts with Gibbs and Cox and got them into the Navy world and um, started working on the uh, propulsion systems for those destroyers, those interwar destroyers. I mean, um, 1930s era uh, destroyers. Now, later you mentioned North Carolina. Now I'm, I'm, I'm interested in North Carolina myself. Um, I'm supposed to be doing a special edition on it. <laughs> So, okay, my three special edition <laughs> authors. Here. Oh, I, I know. Here we go. Giggle late. <laughs> you get it a pass. He's not allowed to talk. And, <laughs> and Alex is the shining, the shining example. Giga early, right? Yeah, there. yeah. I know. Time and on time. Um, I think uh, what spring of uh, next year. By mm. the time we get everything, yeah, sort of you know shiny and polished and mm. looking good, you know. So. Uh, all right, mm. flogging over. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> North Carolina. So she did have some problems, and she would and Washington were rushed into commission spring of 1941, right ahead of the Battle of the Denmark Strait, as it turned out. And um, um, 
and spent a long time working up, working out, as we know, vibration problems. They had to switch the props around and use multi, like two screws with four blades, two with five. You know, they worked all those out and everything. Um, but North Carolina had some some plant problems that persisted and she didn't get an availability. She was commissioned in 41, spent a long part of 41 working up, you know, go down the Roosevelt Road, shoot up the guns, um, test things out. Everything seemed okay. They got the vibration out. Um, Pearl Harbor's attacked. And by January of 42, uh, she's going up to work up in the old training grounds, Casco Bay, Maine, and she stayed. And the idea, Washington was there for a while, Wasp, they went to the home fleet, North Carolina stayed behind. And I think Washington was overall now it's starting to, things that are coming back to me, I think maybe it was because Washington, for a variety of reasons, uh, she performed well in the Pacific later, um, but was in better better condition. They had, she had fewer problems, let's put it that way. So she built where? Uh, Philadelphia versus Philadelphia North Naval <laughs> Shipyard versus North Carolina was uh, built in Brooklyn. In Brooklyn, yeah, and um, and they stopped building ships in in Brooklyn for the yeah. major ships before they stopped building them here, uh, building them here. But in any case, uh, she didn't get an availability, so she went to the Pacific with some of these problems, and uh, everyone was glad to have you know she made this triumphant entrance into Pearl Harbor on July eleventh, nineteen forty two. Um, everyone was glad to see her, but um, some of these problems did persist, and um, they they came up during the Battle of the Eastern Solomons, and then when she was torpedoed, they fortunately had an engineering officer and an assistant engineering officer who had been around a long time, and they were they were experts and went on to other ships, including the Missouri. Um, so now you have starting. This is all new. I, I'm starting to look at some of these things a little differently um, based on, on what I know. Um, now, having said that, they still managed to keep North Carolina. It was, it was like some of this yeah. German thing you're talking about. They still managed to keep North Carolina at 25 knots uh, under stress during the battle. And, and then after she was torpedoed, but then, of course, she had to go back to Pearl Harbor. But um, I don't know. When you're talking about that, that time period, that transition from 42 into 43. And then of course, beyond that, when the tsunami of construction mm. shows up, you know, but I had these letters from, uh, from the engineering officer mm. in early 43 and the ships kind of complain, North Carolina kind of complaining that the battleships aren't really doing much. Now it is on the period I'm talking about is the first half of 43. Well, the first Essex class carriers show up middle mm. of the year, you know, that type of thing. But they're complaining that the destroy, uh, cruisers are doing all the, the heavy lifting still. When now at this point they've got North Carolina, Washington, uh, I think Massachusetts was there by then. Indiana uh, was coming, and um, and they're not doing it. They're pretty idle now. I'm thinking, you know, Nimitz was, you know, he, he'll tell you they won the war because. Of because of the oil, you know, mm. and he was always really concerned about that. So now I'm wondering, you know, he claims that it affected operations, and I'm sure his next book, that's what it's going to be about. And um, so now yeah. we, we just look at things a little differently. Yeah, you know? and I, I think I think there's also, the, you know, it's something that the book highlights is the maintenance, the ongoing maintenance issues, because mm -hmm. obviously if you have a high-pressure system, you put more energy through your, your machinery plant, mm -hmm then it's more likely things are going to break because there's more stress being put on it. And when it does break, the damage is going to be a lot more because the energy involved in breaking it is is significantly greater. And you know, you get things like the, you know, if a let's say you're on a three, three fifty plant, so Japan, Italy, Royal Navy, if you've got a let's say a leak in your steam pipe, mm -hmm. you're like, ah, there is a leak. We shall go and fix it. If you're on a 650 plant, it's like, there is a leak somewhere. We will now ritualistically walk forward with a broom handle and see when it gets cut in half. And if there is a leak on a 1200 plant, you have to run away. Yeah. Um, Jump overboard. Yeah. I'm not doing it. Yeah. But, and, and, and then, of course, because you've now got you know, double or more the pressure, that mm -hmm. means you know, wherever that leak is, it's going to do more damage to that pipe before mm -hmm. before you get it all, all sorted. So yeah. that's more stuff. And I was actually thinking when in the post-war environment, when 
the Canadian Navy were looking at, well, they wanted to operate aircraft carriers for a bit, mm -hmm. and they ended up choosing the some of the Colossus and Majestic 1942 light fleet carrier program ships. Now, materially, those are less capable than an Essex class, mm -hmm. the smaller, slightly. And the US Navy was happy to lend the Canadian Navy a couple of Essexes instead. But the single largest decision maker for the Canadians at that point was the crew and maintenance requirements, because the 1942 light fleet carriers used British scale lower pressure plants. Mm -hmm. And although they're smaller ships, if you look at you know proportionally the size of the engineering crew relative to the displacement of the ship, mm -hmm. the Essexes had needed far, far, far more engineering crew to keep mm -hmm. their plants running than the Majestics did, which I think it, you know it probably is is again it's an underlying thing of it's not just that it's a higher pressure plant with more power it's it needs a lot more work you need a lot more people to keep it operational, which. You know, it, it, that, again, that's that's a cost. So yeah, it's not just one logistic thing of we need more oil. Yeah, and okay, so we which need you more might be oil. able to stop. Which you, which yeah, as the yeah, U.S. Yeah. is like okay, okay, but and I guess that's the whole point is that if in the United States Navy we're able to build all these ships, recruit all these men, train all these people, and crew then crew the ships, fill the engineering plants, six hundred people right in the Iowa oh, class. Oh, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. so. Yeah you can sort of sweep that under the rug. It all just looks like the massive war effort that you're trying to paint this, you know, oh, yep, we can do it. Mm. But then on, I think where the problem comes in, as we mm. said, Germany, these other nations, Canada, that's when you start to say, oh, wow, that really is a problem. Mm. When, you, when you can't get the people, train the people, fuel the ships, that's when it becomes pretty obvious. Yeah. And, and I think that there is also sort of in, in mitigation, we're not saying it's a complete unmitigated disaster, because mm -hmm. spoiler alert, the US Navy still won. Um, <laughs> the, uh, but, you know, because the, there, there are other factors which you can put in favor of high pressure plants. Like, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, energy density is a thing. Mm -hmm. So if you need to get up to a certain speed, you need a certain amount of power, therefore you need a certain amount of machinery in weight and, and, and floor space. Mm -hmm. So if you want to get, like, say, notional design speed of an Iowa 33 knots, if you need 212,000 sharp horsepower to do that, if you're using a lower pressure system, you need more machinery, mm -hmm. which means your machinery spaces are bigger. And then suddenly that means if they're bigger and they're using up more weight, you have to make sacrifices elsewhere mm -hmm. in protection or fuel storage, so range or Armament. armament. Yeah. So... On the flip, on the one hand, yes, it would it would have been an absolute peak to maintain the systems. On the other hand, could you have built an Iowa class mm -hmm. without using the high pressure plant in the manner that she is constructed? And I would yeah. pro say probably not. And achieve this, and like yeah. you said, to achieve this speed. Yeah, yeah, and 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 yeah, and and you've also got things like the unit system, where you um, on a lot of US ships, where you have the boilers and the uh, turbines alternating rather than here's all our turbines, here's all our boilers, because mm -hmm. then you take a hit in one or the other space, that's it, you have no power. Mm -hmm. If you have them in alternating blocks or in combined rooms, um, then mm -hmm. it's like, okay, well, we've lost the number four room, that's annoying, but the other three are still fine. Mm -hmm. That's something you can do if your machinery plant is small enough, you can afford to split it like that. Whereas if it's a larger machinery plant, a lower pressure system to achieve the same power mm -hmm. output, you might be forced to then go, well, we have to put all our boilers in one, one compartment and all our turbines in another compartment because we can't afford the weight or the space to, mm -hmm. to divide them up properly. So, so that, that increases the survivability of the ship, even if the ship is a pig to maintain while it's actually in service. Right. And um, he brings that up. He actually yeah. does mention that as, yeah, right. Yeah, and it's like, you know, I mean, you look at uh, uh, Vanguard, it's a similar displacement, not quite, but similar displacement to the Iowa's. Um, it's not quite as fast. It's somewhat more heavily protected. Um, it's got slightly smaller and one less main gun. Uh, so, but it's using, although it's using a slightly more advanced power plant than, say, the King George V, so it's not hugely advanced. So it's, mm -hmm. And then you, you know, look at, like, uh, the Latorios. Okay, the Latorios are probably a bad example because they're they're designed as short range and they're quite yeah. d drifted. But the Bismarcks are probably a closer example because they're compared to the Iowas, 
baseline 45,000 ton design. The Bisp one's very close to that displacement wise. Mm -hmm. But again, you know, you've got a ship that's a, a couple of thousand tons adrift of the, an Iowa, but it's got, again, smaller guns, fewer guns, shorter range. Le less efficient armor layout. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a whole lot of other design issues with the Bismarcks, <laughs> which I won't go into, but... <laughs> My buoyancy! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but, Single reduction. Yeah. Gear yeah. reduction boxes. But, but then, you know, you, you know what, what could they have done yeah. with the Bismarck design if they had high pr higher pressure plant systems that didn't break every five seconds. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, know, you look at uh, Richelieu, they come, with, they come at it from a slightly different perspective of using higher pressure but not 650 mm. um but they also use four circulation boilers and that's another great example of reducing the footprint yeah their their mm. horsepower per ton is probably the, the greatest of any machinery plant mm. by using the, the four circulation boilers and as a result you get richelieu being the only roughly treaty compliant ship mm -hmm. uh 30, about thirty five thousand tons that breaks the 30 knot barrier Every other battleship in the Second World War that breaks 30 knots is well above the treaty, the original 35,000 ton limit. Um, so that, that gives you an example of how, how your machinery plant, and not even just how reliable it is, but also how much space and weight it takes up, can mm -hmm. affect what the rest of your ship can do. Did, um, from the curator, any special thoughts on New Jersey's plant? Over her years, any anything that sticks out in your mind, or or was she flawless? <laughs> <laughs> well, I suddenly have to question. These ships had a theoretical maximum range of fifteen thousand nautical miles at fifteen knots, their most economical cruising speed. I have to question if that was the case. Mm -hmm. uh, New Jersey did the first in class trials during World War II. I was completed first, obviously, but she goes out to fight. And so New Jersey's the one that actually runs those trials uh, up at Maine. Mm -hmm. um, and there's some sort of mechanical failure, so she doesn't run the trials under full, full power. Mm -hmm. And so all of the fuel curve tables and things are kind of extrapolated from what they had. Mm -hmm. And I have to wonder how accurate those were. Um, Interesting. Because we never, because they never yeah. actually did a test where just sail in a straight line at 15 knots until your gas runs out. Like, like no one ever actually did yeah. that. So how are you supposed to know? It's like you said, it's just based off these calculations, which as the book says, may or may not actually have been correct. And you know, what, how, how are you supposed to know? Cause you're never going to let your fuel ever get down to the point where I'm out of gas and I'm adrift off yes. in the Pacific. And oddly enough, it's actually going to be much harder <laughs> yeah. for a ship that's designed for longer range because, mm -hmm. you know, again, using the notorious as an example, if you've got a relatively small amount of fuel, mm -hmm. your overall trim and balance and everything isn't going to change as much as you burn that fuel off, mm -hmm. especially if you're, you know, filling it up with seawater. But mm -hmm. even then, seawater is slightly different density to fuel. Whereas mm -hmm. if you're an Iowa or something with, you know, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of tons of fuel, mm -hmm. as you burn all that away, that's potentially going to affect your your trim, your balance, mm -hmm. your your you know, freeboard how high you, whether you're riding heavy or light considerably more and yeah. that affects your underwater fuel, resistance yeah, and fuel consumption and, and again you can yeah. mitigate that by using by re refilling the tanks with seawater but as I ju we just said seawater does have a slightly different density so that small difference will become a much larger issue mm -hmm. if you have twice as much fuel aboard mm -hmm. um so yeah, the, the, what exactly your power consumption is at 15 knots, that's 80% fuel versus what the power consumption is going to be at 15 knots with 20% fuel is going to be a slightly different matter. So with that being said, U.S. Navy's high pressure steam plants, the, the decision, the rushed, seemingly rushed decision to go to 600 PSI plants for a lot of our primary frontline ships, um, do we obviously? It's hard to say because eventually, you know, you still win the war. Mm -hmm. So it's if like Germany, like I said, if we had lost, then oh we, no, that's a huge negative. That was a huge, mm -hmm. you know, failure. But in our case, if, it's, if it still works, then is is it a failure? Yeah. So Admiral Admiral Bowen, just for the record, was marginalized after the war. You know, they, they did a name a Knox class frigate after him. Um, but, and he wrote a book 
and a lot of the navies and a lot of historians have accepted his interpretation of what went on in his uh, autobiography from 1954. That's what he would say. And um, when in fact it was well known within the navy that oh, it was portrayed as a uniquely. I mean, when I was listening to Alex talk, mm. he was like, "Well, there are advantages, you know." Mm. But it was portrayed as a uniquely American advantage, but maybe it was a uniquely American situation. Uh, where you know, only when, our logistics could have supported mm -hmm. the shortcomings enough to actually make it uh, an actual a good thing. Yeah, mm. because yeah. the issue is too is that mm -hmm. you come out of the war, there's no threat. Uh, the threat has ended, and you have allies, mm. and it, this fleet now, it's got to last us. <laughs> so the World War II fleet, of course, as we know, mm -hmm. lasted into the seventies, eighties. Uh, Right. And beyond, yeah, and and a beyond. couple of us. Yeah, you know, I was yeah. Lexington. Yeah, yeah. 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 I think right. it, it, I think it probably might be a better idea to maybe consider it in terms of efficiency rather than was it a failure or not? Because you know, a failure suggests it didn't work. Correct. And right. the ships weren't breaking down every five minutes. It didn't make yeah. it work. Yeah. 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 Whereas you know, yeah, if you can make the situation work, but it requires a lot more resource input, whether that be in terms of manpower or mm -hmm. more spare parts or more fuel. It's not an efficient solution, mm -hmm. but if you've got the resources you, and to brute force it so that you can sort of ignore those issues and mm -hmm. still take away the advantages of more compact space and less weight of machinery demand, then it's it's kind of, I guess in, in some ways you could almost look at it like, like in a battle, you can have a strategic failure, but a tactical victory or yeah. vice versa, mm -hmm. you know, like Coral Sea. Coral you, sea. You, yeah. you sink, let the Japanese sink Lexington and damage Yorktown, they they trade Shoho tactically. That's fantastic. The Japanese have won. Strategically, they don't get to invade Port Moresby. They've lost. Yeah. Um, and the same thing with the, some of the battles in, in Guadalcanal, mm -hmm. um, or you know, or, or like a, like a, I constantly harp on poor old Bismarck. It's like yeah, she's an inefficient ship. She's not a failure of a ship because she's still lethal. She can mm -hmm. still go toe to toe with a treaty era vessel mm -hmm. she needs seven thousand more tons to do it which makes her an inefficient vessel but it doesn't make her <laughs> not a threat yeah, yeah. um right. and yeah and, the, and the, i mean even if you want to put it in computer game terms you think about it like um you know something like age of empires 2 the classic <laughs> it's like if you happen to control the gold reserves or most of the gold on the map you can build your elite units like you know longbowmen or huskulls or whatever mm -hmm. Those units are actually hilariously resource inefficient, mm -hmm. but if you've got the resources, their additional hit points, their additional armor, sure. their additional you know firepower can tip the balance of the game, as opposed to someone who just has loads of food and wood and can spam out spearmen. Mm -hmm. But if you don't have access to that gold, you're forced to resort to other things like spamming scouts and spearmen and, and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. And that's kind of you know, I think it's probably that that's what you're seeing with the U.S. of yes. As you said, with any other nation, that probably it probably would have caused a lot more issues. But with the US, they're like, well, if we need more fuel, well, guess what? We have more fuel. We need more oilers, we can build more oilers. We need more men, we have a massive population base. Great. And they're fairly technologically savvy. So mm -hmm. you don't have you know, it's not like Russia where you're dragging some surf who's probably the, the most complicated technology I've seen up to that point is the wooden car. And going, congratulations, by the way, water exists in very large quantities. Also, here's a steam plant. Learn how to <laughs> learn how to run it in the next three weeks, or the political officer will shoot you. <laughs> yeah. Right. And it was just it's funny you brought up because I was just thinking that. It's mm. like, you know, here's here's Mosin the gun, comrade. Mm. Go charge a German machine gun. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, well, that's how you solve the your, your <laughs> your Eastern Front problem. Mm -hmm. you know? Yeah, whereas if you, you yeah. like, you know, by the by the 30s, yeah. if you drag even the average like Iowa farmhand and you're like, yeah. congratulations, here's the sea, here's a ship, have fun. Oh, I've like, rigged up my tractor. Yeah, I know how exactly. to do this. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's like, oh, well, this is just a big version. <laughs> yeah, right. Exactly. Fuel go in, mm. big explosion happen, exhaust yeah. goes out, we go forward. It's fine. Yeah. Start yeah. making your noises hit with spanner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Except don't hit the high pressure pipe because that'll yeah. cut you in half. <laughs> it's like, don't do not do that, Chief. Um, well, so I think, uh, I think this was a good foray into the idea of the Navy's 600 pound plants being a problem, problem again, maybe, maybe not. Um, obviously, Ryan, thank you so much. 
uh, Alex, Drag, thank you so much for for joining us too. Rick, good 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 job. I think you'll probably end up doing a a deeper dive into this once we sort of finish the the, the larger research. Yeah, I think we would talk to this guy. You know, I know who his advisor was John Samita. Did all that work on the Royal Navy, and um, yeah, it's 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 very interesting. He's saying we can't afford. We we're talking about just to extend the conversation briefly. Uh, we can't afford that now. We can't do. We can't make that kind of mistake now because we do not have those unlimited resources that we seem to have in the late thirties and World War Two. And then obviously, then delays projects because everyone's trying to make sure everything is so perfect that eventually. You waste 10 years on something and the whole world's already moved on. Yeah, yeah. It's, it, in many ways it's changed. Yeah, it's very different. I mean, yeah. like I said, they brought Polaris to, to full deployment in a short period of time. But yeah, those days might be over. Can't do it now. All right. Well, thank you everyone so much for watching. Again, gentlemen, thank you. It was always good seeing you. This was a wonderful weekend. Mm -hmm. uh, I think you're probably ready to head back home. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're, these quick popover trips to the U.S. to probably take a toll. I can't even imagine. Yeah. yeah, well, at least it's the East Coast, not San Diego. <laughs> that's, that's, that's fair enough. <laughs> right. um, so if you have any questions, uh, we'll do our best to answer. If you put them down below and make sure, you know, obviously, if you like this kind of stuff, like, subscribe, tell us, uh, and we can do more in the future. So again, gentlemen, thank you. Thanks, everyone, for watching. Have a good one. Bye.